Welcome to our first episode from Chapter 2A. And in Chapter 2A, we're just going to learn about basic chemistry and the chemistry of water. So let's get started with this first episode on atomic structure. Now, a lot in this episode hopefully is a review with maybe just a few new things put in here. But a lot of this should be review. All right, so when we talk about chemistry, we need to start talking about the atom. Because the atom is the basic... A unit of matter. So you can't get anything less than an atom when it comes to really everything in the universe. Now, the atom has three main atomic particles. And these they're listed right down in here. Protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now, you could remember them with an acronym like this, P-E-N. So think of atomic pen. Protons, electrons, and neutrons. Protons are always going to be, for us, we're going to use the symbol P positive because P for protein, or excuse me, P for proton, but the positive refers to its charge. It has a positive charge, so a positive electrical charge. Now, these guys are going to weigh one atomic mass unit. Now, uh, these subatomic particles weigh lay, way less than a gram, and that's really too small of a number for us to comprehend. So we created a new metric unit called an atomic yeah. mass unit, AMU for short, and protons weigh one of those. Now neutrons, N, zero, these guys have a neutral charge. So look at the first five letters, and those are the same five letters in a neutron. So think of a neutron, neutral charge, or you could say they have no charge. Now they also weigh one atomic mass unit. Electrons, E minus is a symbol for them. They have a negative charge. And these guys have so little mass, they are 1 1840th of an atomic mass unit. So for all intents and purposes, as far as we're concerned, think of an electron as having basically no mass. Now if you look over here in this picture, you can see that protons, which are these blue things right in here, and neutrons, which are red, these guys are found in the nucleus. The electrons are found outside of the nucleus, and that is the topic of our next slide. Okay, which subatomic particles are going to be found in the nucleus? Those are going to be your protons and your neutrons. Now remember, these guys have a positive charge. These have a neutral charge. Therefore, the overall charge of the nucleus is going to be positive. Now which subatomic particles are going to be outside the nucleus? Those are the electrons. Remember, electrons have a negative charge. Now, electrons have a lot of energy. They're always constantly moving around. And for us, we're going to say that they're in orbits known as energy levels. So let's think of a nucleus as the center of a solar system. And let's say that the electrons are moving around like the planets do around our sun. So, so let's say we got two electrons here, and we'll just say we have those on the outside. Okay, now in this example, we have six protons in the nucleus. So right in here, that's the nucleus. And we have six electrons. All right? Now, as we can see down here, what's the overall charge of an atom? It's going to be neutral because the number of protons are going to cancel out the number of electrons. So six minus six equals zero. Oh. Now in this case, because we have six protons, this happens to be a carbon atom, and we're gonna learn why that is coming up shortly, all right? So just remember, the nucleus has protons and neutrons on the inside, it has an overall positive charge. The outside of the uh, nucleus is going to have a negative charge because it only has the electrons. And remember, electrons are in energy levels, and therefore, the negatives on the outside cancel out the positives on the inside, and it's a neutral situation. Oh. All right, so what is an element? An element is simply one type of atom, all right? And an element is based upon the atomic number. So these are our periodic table basics. And I want to make sure that you understand these, okay? So make a little note. You can notice that they're color. That means that they're important. We need to know the difference between the atomic number and the mass number. Now, the atomic number is the number of protons. 
and this is going to determine what element it is. And it also tells you the number of electrons if it's going to be neutral. So if you look right over here, that six is the atomic number. Let me draw a line right there, okay? That's the atomic number. So anything with an atomic number of six is going to be carbon. Just write carbon right there for you, okay? Now the mass number, which is this larger number down here, this is the number of protons and neutrons. So this is going to be pretty much the mass of the nucleus. Let me get myself caught up here. There you go, okay? So these are the two most important things. You see this .01 in here? They're taking into account the isotope, so it's sort of an average weight for the, but it's a weighted average for the nucleus. So we're just going to kind of round up. So we have 12 protons and neutrons inside the nucleus, and we have an atomic number of six. Now, if I want to find out what the number of neutrons are, all I have to do is I take the mass number and I subtract the atomic number. So in this case, let's use a different color because we can, the number of neutrons in a carbon atom are going to be equal to the number 12 minus 6, mass number minus atomic number, and that's going to give us the number 6. So carbon is kind of devilish. It has 6 electrons, 6 neutrons, and 6 uh, protons. 666, six, six, the mark of the beast. <laughs> All right, enough of that silly enough, so let's move on. All right, so what's an isotope? Well, if you look at the word isotope, it's trying to tell you what's, what it means. Iso is simply a word that means the same, okay? It's the, an atom of the element, so it's the same element. It's got the same number of protons, but it has an unusual number of neutrons. So it's going to have a slightly different mass number, and in fact, we identify isotopes by their mass number. So think of uranium-235. This is the radioactive form of uranium that's used in nuclear power plants, okay? Uranium, that's the symbol for uranium, but its mass number is 235. It's the radioactive isotope that's used most often. Now, I do want you to pay attention down here to C. Isotopes have the same chemical properties, and what we mean by chemical properties is basically how does it make chemical bonds. Because it has the exact same number of protons and more importantly the exact same number of electrons, it's going to create the same type of chemical bonds that you would expect if it wasn't an isotope. So I want to make sure you understand this stuff. Isotopes are the same element, different number of neutrons. Neutrons, or I'm sorry, is isotopes are identified by their mass numbers and they have the same chemical properties. All right, so if you don't understand those words, we've got a picture to help you out. These are three different uh, isotopes of carbon. Notice they're identified by their mass number, carbon-12, which is the most common form of it, carbon-13, and then carbon-14, which is the radioactive one. And we're going to talk about radioactivity on our next slide. Now, you'll notice that carbon-12 is devilish 666 six protons, six neutrons. Carbon-13 has one extra neutron. Seven plus six is 13. And carbon-14 is going to have two extra neutrons. And that makes it really unstable to the fact that it is radioactive. All right, our final slide in this episode. Radioactive isotopes are isotopes that have an unstable nucleus. That nucleus is going to decay uh, in the future. Now, by decay, that simply means to fall apart. So what happens in this nucleus, it's going to split into two or three or more pieces. So this carbon-14 could break into two new elements, whatever those would be. And that would be determined by how many protons are in each uh, of those two nuclei. Now, what can I use a radioactive isotope for? Well, I can use it to date rocks and fossils. That would be known as carbon dating. Fact. This is one of the ways we find out how old the dinosaurs were. Uh, we can use it to treat cancer and kill bacteria. Uh, cancer treatment, the radioactive cancer treatments that's used mainly for like brain tumors. 
Um, we can use um, this stuff to kill bacteria, which could be used in the food sources and even in hospitals to, to kill germs and make sure that patients don't get affected. We can also use them as a label or a tracer. If we stick a radioactive isotope inside a compound, we now have a way to track it because that radioactive uh, isotope is going to give off energy, which can be used on the film stock, x-rays, etc. And when we get into chapter 12, we're going to talk about an experiment that was done by a scientific team where one individual's name, last name was Hershey, and their partner's name was Chase. So this is a famous Hershey and Chase experiment where we were able to determine if it was protein or DNA that was the inheritable factor. In other words, what got passed on the next generation? Was it the proteins that were used to, for inheritance, or was it the DNA? And their, um, their actual experiment proved that it was DNA that was moving from one generation to the next. All right, that's going to wrap up our first episode here. So until our next one, we're going to catch you on the flip side. <laughs>